Hey guys, it's Blockchain Brad, and today I'm honored to speak with a good friend. It's Data Dash or Nick Merton. Nick, thank you so much for coming on the channel just to catch up and get real on the blockchain. Hey Brad, it's a pleasure as always, man. Thanks for having me on. No worries, mate. Now it's late there and I know you've made time for me just to catch up and I really appreciate it. Nick, you know, how's everything going? What have you been doing lately? It's been a while since we caught up. What's piquing your interest right now? Oh man, well, there's a lot of things going on. So, I mean, obviously crypto markets have started to warm up again, which I guess has gotten a lot of people kind of rekindled back into the space. I've been interested in it in a bull or bear market. Um, the thing for me right now is I've been trying to kind of ramp up some content production for the channel. So we just today put out a uh, top 10 altcoin video for 2020. I've decided uh, I really wanted to, rather than in 2017, where I did kind of like a, a month by month kind of top three picks, I just decided to do 10 that I'm confident on and kind of stick with that throughout the annual year. Mm. Uh, as we start and that's really them. cool, Nick, because mm -hmm. that's bold. You know, when, whenever we see top 10s, you know, we never really know how to take them because some don't research and it's more just for populist agenda. But I know you right. and I know you research and you certainly are very um, use case focused. So was it tough to deduce the ones that you It was. Were? It, I, you know, it's funny because I stepped out a lot of my uh, outside of my comfort zone a little bit and tried to look at some of the other really steady use cases. So as you know, I'm like big on like the aspect of money and peer to peer digital currency. And there's only so many, I mean, there's a decent amount of players that are going for that, but uh, ones that are really like kind of winners in that space. And I started to look elsewhere. Um, and I started to realize that there was a lot of projects I like, um, you know, in the sense of solving the Oracle problem, I was interested in Chainlink, uh, mm -hmm. basic attention token in the sense of uh, kind of the attention economy and serving as a, an alternative for, uh, you know, Google and a lot of the dominant players in, in the ad space. I mean, there's all kinds of players. Uh, in yeah, that I, I love though that we're going through them. So you've got Chainlink and I, I actually have one I wanted to talk to you about as well. I spoke with them this morning. So here's a big plug, you know, for those who are into research. I don't know if you know of them, but they're called Band Protocol. And they are also doing something very similar to data governance. And they're looking at ways in which they can embed uh, better data support, make sure that the, an overall overarching structure that embeds oracles, just like Chainlink in many respects, is trying to bridge uh, the needs of layer ones and the DAPs as well. And so now we're seeing um, interesting potential collaborations even in the future, I would think, with, with Chainlink Absolutely. and some others. Yeah. I, I'm so excited to see it fixed because the thing is, I'm someone who, though I'm more focused on the financial aspects, I kind of brought this up in the video, I'm, I'm much more interested in being able to store value, transfer value, which we've already kind of proven with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies out there. Um, and you can do it with Ethereum as well. But mm. the thing is, I think there's so many unique cases, whether financial or non-financial, with smart contracts. And no matter what it is, at the end of the day, you're going to need to connect to some kind of out, uh, external data source or something that's off-chain. Exactly. So I'm really interested. I mean, I've known about the Oracle problem for a while since back in 2017. I just was it kind of rekindled as I started to see uh, Chainlink go to mainnet and then also as well uh, some of the partnerships that they've been landing. But I, I have to look into band protocol. I think it's interesting. And there's a lot of things that are getting solved right now in the crypto space at the moment. Some some projects that, you know, for a long time seemed kind of dormant, but are now coming out. They were building to the bear market. And I think they're kind of coming, they're going to come out swinging in 2020. But um, outside of that overall, just kind of towards the original question, I, the other thing I'm working on a, a, a crypto startup at the moment. I can't talk too much about it, but um, I always like yeah, when you so talk I, about this though. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I wish I could talk more about it, but it's basically, long story short, just um, just focusing around uh, expanding access to cryptocurrencies, trying to bring more people in the space right now in a practical nature. Um, and uh, yeah, just keeping up with the space as always. It's, it's, it's a whirlwind. Well, it keeps you busy 24-7. Well, Nick, you know I'm looking forward to hearing more about your peer-to-peer -peer, uh, project as well because you've always been an advocate for the initial uh, premise of even BTC, you know, of the true um, Nakamoto protocol agenda, you know, trying to establish something that is for the people. And often even on camera, off camera, we're always talking about the benefits it can bring to the globe, whether that be, you know, us in our more privileged regions, but or, or those in the developing regions of the globe. That's personally one of the things I do think is such an exciting area because right now we're not seeing a lot of evidence of how it can benefit in those particular regions where, say, for example, someone can engage with their phone, which is the, their hard, the hardware of choice in those regions, and really start to change their social position, their economic position. Uh, I genuinely mean it, Nick. As a teacher, um, I want to see more evidence that this can be life-changing for people. And I think you're the same. 
You're absolutely right, Brad. So the problem right now is that in the crypto space, uh, I think we're too focused right now. I think a a lot of people are chasing selfish ambitions at the end of the day. Uh, But the problem right now is that there's a lot of impractical use cases of crypto, and we haven't really scaled a lot of the financial applications. So in the Ethereum movement right now, there's something that's quite exciting. It's the DeFi movement or decentralized finance movement. Mm. Um, And that's from projects like MakerDAO, uh, Compound Finance, a lot of these platforms. They're a really good start. They're way to uh, increase the the interest return that you can make uh, on your capital, a way to, in a decentralized format without trusted parties, be able to lend capital, and then also be able to give anyone in the world stable coins. Uh, so, for example, there's a MakerDAO's DAI in this case, which is it's a U.S. dollar peg stable coin. You mm. can send it anywhere across the world. I know, actually, you know about this because you've also talked with um, yeah. um, I think, um, the, one of the other stable coin projects that's out there. Terra. Yeah, about Terra, yeah. and Terra, and a few others as well. Mm. A bit of yeah, a fan so, of some of them. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of exciting innovations. And I think that the stablecoin space is going to be very good actually for cryptocurrencies because the thing about it is, A, it's going to get more people comfortable downloading. If you're using, for example, DAI, or I don't know about Terra in this case, but I know it, DAI is based on the Ethereum network and it's collateralized with Ethereum. Mm. That sets demand for Ethereum, not to mention you're able to give the world until the day we have hyperinflation or the dollar collapse. You're going to be able to give people the world reserve currency. And now we're going to live in a framework where, for example, we've, we've been talking about Libra coming up here. If Libra gets shut down and we're trying to help someone in Venezuela, for example, let's say you and I, Brad, had some money and we're like, you know what? We want to earn some interest, but we want to go help and provide capital to those in Venezuela. Mm. If we have MakerDAO's die in our Ethereum wallet, the only thing they need is an Ethereum wallet on their mobile phone or on a computer, you know, something of that sort that can apply an Ethereum address and we can send it to them. And we're able to actually give them access to credit. And this goes towards what you were talking about earlier, talking Mm -hmm. about real use cases. The missing part right here, and I think it's going to be one of the biggest leading factors in the next cycle is, uh, and not to mention as well, to get us to user adoption of rather than less than 1% to three or 5%, we're going to expand credit markets. And that's going to be through being able to bring access to lending across the world, borderless lending in this case, so much how Bitcoin and most blockchain projects set out to be borderless payment networks. Right. Uh, you need to be able to um, you know, democratize and make it as simple as possible for people to get access to credit. It's one of the biggest things that's helped uplift uh, the modern world in this case, providing a financial infrastructure to exactly. do so. And, I mean, and access and, to financial services. And if you look at the, the way in which technologies really change the game, Nick, pre-blockchain even, or uh, the way we've seen different types of peer-to-peer lending, you know, certainly the narrative is shifting towards um, enfranchising more empowerment, more autonomy. Um, I, I personally got involved with peer-to-peer banking even as a uh, as a member of a bank, you know, as someone who went and got a loan before blockchain. I did that because I wanted to, you know, provide interest to another party that wasn't necessarily that bank. So I, th- I certainly do agree with you. I think that we're seeing more and more uh, interest from uh, generations right now who want to uh, engage in different narratives, you know, change the game from that traditional centralized model. And definitely in those regions that are, uh, are more um, top down, you know, that, and often you see dictatorships as that, some examples, or it might just be, you know, a powerless state you know, for, for the people at least. And often there's inflation rife there for their own currencies. Mm-hmm. This really can change things for them, literally down to, you know, simple, simple things like being able to access basic goods and services, and having basic rights. This can really revolutionize things if they can be empowered to, you know, have access to funds. Now, the, the biggest question though is, with Libra, is it the attention with Libra, Nick, that has been beneficial, given that it is genuinely so centralised with those, those parties that are behind it and backing it? Or is it, you know, Libra itself that you think is good? Yeah. Well, to build on a little thing that you were hinting to earlier in this case, you know, I think way, uh, earlier on towards the beginning of the video, you talked about kind of like how crypto could help uh, kind of the first world regions, kind of the developed world, mm. and also those that are underdeveloped. And I think back to when I went to the Philippines, I think uh, not to mention as well as to areas you talked about, like Venezuela, Argentina, that are ripe with hyperinflation. This is something mm. that they've experienced historically multiple times. Um, the thing I always think about is that cryptocurrencies, it's a new financial asset class. Um, you know, and I don't mean asset in the sense of investment. This is going to be a new currency, emerging currency class in this case that people will be able to use to exchange and store value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think that this, you know, even if we're just talking about a subsect of the world in this case in the developing region, that really will see this as a currency class. 
this is going to be uh, not only a multi-trillion dollar asset class, but it is going to uplift a lot of people. It's going to provide them a safe haven to store value under corrupt governments, under governments that have continued to try to manage monetary policy and continue to see hyperinflation. Mm. And not to mention as well, underbanked economies in this case. So uh, in, that, in that essence of uh, helping to serve the underbanked economy or those kind of areas that need cryptocurrencies, uh, this is where the first world can benefit. The first world will benefit in this case by being able to own cryptocurrencies and be able to lend it out in this case. We'll be able to uh, lend out our, whether it be Bitcoin uh, to Ethereum or our stable coins in this case. And we're going to get much better interest rates than what we do in a savings account right now. We're, there's, there's the difference, I guess, kind of in first world and third world problems when it comes to finance. Third world, you can't even get access to credit. Right. Um, not to mention as well a bank account, but in the first world, yeah, you can get access to a bank account in one of the more renowned banking systems in the world, but you get 0.08% interest on average annually. And there's other savings account things that are like, Hey, we'll pay 1%. Like, Oh, that's crazy. Right. You know, they, you they sell it as, fees on top of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're going to eat you up with the fees anyways. And not to mention it doesn't keep up with inflation. Right. Um, but, but to build on what you said in this case, so like crypto is going to be able to fix a lot of those. Libra, I, as much as I think there are some positives to come out of Libra, I, I, I completely am all for Facebook being able to experiment with it. Uh, I, I, I don't think, you know, you know, it would be like me telling, uh, you know, the government should censor an open source project. I mm. think they can go do what they want. Uh, whether it's good for crypto or not, it's, it's inevitable. They, there is going to be corporate cryptocurrencies. Well, like they're Libra. doing it anyway, Nick, because they're registered in Switzerland. So I think that's, yeah, that was their they're doing it. They're doing it exactly like most crypto startups. That's the funny thing. They yeah. they have basically, uh, um, basically, I think it's based in Geneva. They have the Libra Foundation, yeah, uh, or Libra Association. Sorry, uh, but you're you're right. The, the, here's the thing about Libra, though, is that Libra is uh, has the ambitions of becoming an open public network, similar to most cryptocurrencies in the future, and that would make it a cryptocurrency eventually. Um, outside of two facts. One, that it's backed by a reserve of assets. There, that means there's always going to be a trusted asset. I would see that more as a token in this case because there are say. like, uh, yeah, there's like, you know, for example, like USD Tether. That's a trusted factor that there's something backing it. Mm. Um, but in the, the essence of it all, the reason why Libra is not a cryptocurrency and why it's going to fail is the simple fact that it is a consortium of companies that run the network. And because it is so centralized in this case, even if they add twice the amount of corporate partners. Their network is centralized. There are points of failure. Those companies are under legal frameworks where, hey, if they don't cooperate, uh, they can easily, you know, basically, you know, charge these companies, eventually shut down the networks, whether the companies want to or not. And when you have a system like that, and the government of Venezuela says, hey there, US government, um, we don't want you to allow people to send Libra through Facebook's applications, through the Libra wallet, uh, work through Apple, censor them out. They cannot send it to any mobile phones that are under an IP in Venezuela. Mm. Right. And yeah, m yeah, maybe you could have VPNs and stuff like that. But the fact of the matter is you just simply cut out the solution for people in Venezuela, just like that. Exactly. Whereas on an Ethereum wallet, an Ethereum wallet, there's thousands of them and there's, there's no discretion against them. There's so many right. different ways set up an Ethereum account and, 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 and you can thing, see die across the world. And the, and the thing is as well, Nick, I mean, a lot of the people don't discuss this, but with Libra, there's a real lack of seniorage as well built into the model. I mean, that's, you know, we were talking about Libra before. That's one of the benefits of, of, of Terra rather is that with Terra's model, then they've considered that. And on top of that, with with Libra, many people overlook the fact that there is that dual token model, and we don't know a lot of the details of the other part of that, and, and what the agenda is, and how um, profits are sent back to those original investors. I mean, once again, not only do we have the the question of that centralised agenda, what it could mean to have you know two uh, uh, potentially overlapping interests. People, you know, right all the way to Congress are suggesting there isn't that um, inherent. Um, connection or interconnection between the, the Libra coin and Facebook itself. But beyond the narrative of that, we have to be sort of cognizant of the potential in, in the future for an alignment of interests uh, of these core entities that back Libra. That's, that's, that to me is more my concern is because are we, would we just be, would we be in this instance reinventing or, or re, restating the, the narratives that we're trying to break down with new decentralized technologies? That, yeah. That's the big thing. Would it be a 360? I just honestly, you know, for example, maybe this is me thinking too cypherpunk, libertarian, crypto-esque in a sense. But I, I just think it's so, in the long term, it's so 
inefficient to back your currency by a variety of treasuries and currencies because cryptocurrencies at the end of the day are a hedge. That's, that's why they're valuable. They're a hedge against the distrust in governments. And I mean, we're in an environment right now, uh, especially in the European region, like where European banks are struggling right now. Their, their stock prices, for example, are quite telling. They're down towards levels not seen since between 2008 and the 1990s. Mm-hmm. So it says that there's something really broken in this financial system. And the pure fact that Libra is giving up so many areas where, and I understand it's, it's hard to find a perfect solution, not to mention Facebook, I think genuinely does have the interest of trying to, uh, to help unbanked regions because there is a monetary incentive for them. But when your entire currency is backed by you know, government reserve treasuries or uh, currencies in this case, I don't think that's a very lo- good long-term solution. Right. And then outside of that as well, again, you're running it through a consortium. Exactly. Can't be used for wealth, in my opinion. It's perfectly well said as well, because the consortium itself, underpinning that, is the agenda of profit. And I think that's the thing you made a good point on by saying that there isn't necessarily direct uh, connection in terms of the way in which Libra can uh, work and synchronize with Facebook, but indirectly, certainly, um, because otherwise Facebook wouldn't do it. You know, they wouldn't put up, put forth a suggestion to Libra if there wasn't some sort of um, long-term benefit or potential of that to really facilitate in um, the, up, the, the greater support or the continuing support of Facebook itself. Um, and obviously just for sheer accessibility. That was also my concern is at what point do we start to acknowledge the kinds of power that is brought um, and, and, and an entity can wield when they have the ability to essentially dictate the outcomes of a currency, you know, because that's the reality is that this, we're talking literally about a currency. That's why the Congress took it so seriously. Now, in that context, what are your thoughts on regulation? Because many of the world over, we're seeing G7 alliances emerge. I mean, these governments are aligning because they're scared, I think. Should they be? Uh, And should they be doing their own sovereign currencies in this sense as a digital currency for their region? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, honestly, again, I'm fine with Facebook experimenting with it. Uh, The problem that I see is inevitably, we're going to have to learn uh, history's lesson yet again, that again, you can't have central, well, well, it's either going to be one of two pictures, right? Mm. It's either going to be that governments and central banks regulate Libra out of ever existing, which is again, it's really good because they've kind of got each other focused on one another right now, rather than what's going on this space because they know they can't really stop what's going on here Mm. Uh, so they'd much rather make libra the enemy and focus on that and broaden out cryptocurrencies under that label Mm. but um anyways you're already seeing libra is not going to be able to really shake anything up severely uh, that would disrupt the traditional financial sector's position uh, or uh, anything that's out outside of the band of regulators in this case it's never going to be a public open ledger in my in my opinion right now there's sense yeah, and then now there's the, there's the doomsday scenario where let's say, for example, the government allows them to do what they want and Facebook with, you know, it's nearly 2 billion active, I think it's over 2 billion active users, you know, on a, on a monthly basis, uh, is basically able to have, you know, one of the world's strongest currencies, not to mention as well, is running through payment networks that it runs and one day it decides, oh, no, I don't want to actually service you because you don't fit a certain viewpoint that we support on the platform or you've done this certain activity, very similar to China's credit system. Again, very far out idea. I don't even, I don't see that happening as cynical as I am on Facebook sometimes, Mm -hmm. but that is a worry in this case. And it's the reason why Bitcoin is so important, why it is important to just, out of all things in life, there's a few things you need, absolutely no third party or trusted actor leading, and that's money. We have seen it historically. It has ruined economies. It's created boom-bust cycles. If we simply have sound money in this case, if we simply have money left alone under the exact principles that people agreed on from the get-go when they purchased that coin, when they mined that coin, or when it was generated by the code and framework of its original founders, that's the most beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that it is not subject to change. It can. It's programmable money. You could technically update the Bitcoin network but people lose faith in it in that case. Right, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about because some of the academics in the space are talking about things like social consensus. They're talking about the potential for not just manipulation, but literally changing the, the metrics themselves. That can be done, as you know. So does it ever bother you that nothing's finite necessarily on the blockchain, even though it is 
transparent? I'd say this in the case of um, some altcoins, yes, that have like central, like almost consortium like control in the network because they're either so early or they just have decided to be structured like that. In the case of Bitcoin, I don't see that as a worry. I am interested to see what solution people will come up with in 2100 when the Bitcoin block reward comes out. Right. Again, that's a, I guess a problem for a day <laughs> where we, we, we can hope to be alive at uh, that time. But um, in the sense of, um, you know, this question of like uh, these, these, blockchains that are seen as immutable in the framework of how they operate. I would say that I'm not concerned about Bitcoin. And the reason I'm not is because on the Bitcoin network, if tomorrow the miners decided to push a hard fork to double the Bitcoin supply or double the block reward in this case mm. to you know, possibly give them, you would think it'd be like, well, it'd be in the miners best interest to basically double their, uh, their stake in Bitcoin in this case that they'd earn if they got a block reward. Right. We would have, we would have seen it by now. If, especially in the early days. It's like software. If there's any kind of um, big shifts you're going to make, it's best to make them early on. Mm. Uh, and that's why Ethereum, for example, did the, um, the rollback on the chain. Uh, and that's why, there, of course, there's the debacle between that and Ethereum Classic. But um, that's why they did it very early on. That's just the mindset of software. Mm. Uh, to help reverse that in the early days gives it that Ethereum, uh, gives Ethereum net, Ethereum's network in this case, much more room to run in the future. Right. What, what, about, what about the forkability of it though, Nick? I mean, we saw not through any fault of, you know, the, the organic um, way in which BTC plays out, but we've seen subsequent forks um, and the parties associated with them, you know, challenge each other publicly. We've seen hashing wars play out. It's never, never, never a good thing to see those kinds of uh, things play out in a public sense, and even in a technological sense, did it, does it ever bother you that those things were tainting the name and brand that what that is and continues to be BTC? I, I don't like it, but at the same time, I, I don't worry about it because it, it's, it, I think it's funny. It's, it's, you know, we saw, for example, I don't, I don't want to go too much off topic, but just to build on this kind of, these, these kind of attacks on the Bitcoin network. Mm. Um, and, I, and I don't hit so much hate the community for like Bitcoin Cash or some of the, the more serious forks in this case. I say all the best to them. We'll see which one wins. Mm. But the, the fact of the matter is, is whether it be measurement through hashing power, um, whatever measurement you use to determine what is the real Bitcoin, Bitcoin in this case has remained champion. It has been resistant to exchange hacks. It has been resistant to all kinds of different things as a network because for the last nine years, it's just worked. It does exactly what it intends. If you manage your keys properly and you generate those keys through a proper wallet, you own your own Bitcoin. You can transmit them. No one can censor it. You can send it at any time of the day. There is no downtime. And because it's been so resilient over these last years, it's had a few flaws. There's been a few bugs, and luckily we, we spot them, and the code gets more refined. That's mm. why they're very hesitant to make changes. The fact of the matter is, is that it works. And right. It's, it's resilient. And, I, and um, I totally agree. I mean, the fact that there's no on and off button as well, that immutability is everything, Nick. But what about you know, the suggestions at the very least? I'd love to know your thoughts on this of the early uh, stakeholders. I mean, it was obvious right from the outset that it wasn't just simply something that was egalitarian and, and equitable by design. There were certain pe people that had a huge amount of these BTC. And so does it ever bother you that, you know, there can be such significant stakeholders, especially if, there is a, if they're aligning in any way that where they can have a huge uh, say in the, um, the volatility and the way in which BTC price even moves. Does it bother you that this could happen? Well, the, orig the original incentive mechanism of giving a lot of Bitcoin first was to get hashing power because it, you have to think about it from like ground zero. If you have new software, if you have a new idea, and I can say from the struggles that I had with Project Genesis trying to get people on board and stuff, and I, I know you've been doing some great stuff with Blockvera, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to get people incentivized to jump on. Yeah, and sometimes you have to, it, it, as you mentioned, you know, this world is, the world is driven by profit a lot of the time. How can I gain by putting my resources and my time into something? And the fact of the matter is, is that what you have to do is you, you can use profit as an incentive, but the, the incentive structure needs to be aligned with how you want your network to function and the security of that network. And Bitcoins is that. It's simply that if you own a dominant amount of hashing power in the network, if you're constantly trying to earn income that is received in the form of the currency of that network, you don't have a incentive to double spend to make the network inefficient and not work. You don't have an incentive to double the block size in this case, the block reward. Um, 
so it's it's the incentives are very simple in nature, but they are very very efficient, and that's why Bitcoin's work now. In the sense of just on a philosophical level, uh, do I think that there's a problem with a lot of people owning a lot of Bitcoin? I would say that um, you know, I, as much as the next guy, it's not that I so much don't like wealth inequality. It's I would like to see a healthy, thriving middle class in any economy. That's I think right. what I think this desire. Um, if we'll be able to get that with Bitcoin or not, I'm not sure. I see, however, Bitcoin in this case, if more people own more Bitcoin, it's not a worry for me mm -hmm. because if they mined it at the time, it's, it's fair in the sense of the market. But the thing that I would say is that they can only manipulate price one way and that's selling. Uh, they can't basically, you know, they can't prop up the price in this case with the Bitcoin because they already own the asset. They would need to get extra cash, pay at the market rate and buy it up. Mm -hmm. um, if they're early adopters, you know, Satoshi, if Satoshi's still alive and has their million, their million Bitcoin. Who knows? Uh, yeah, who, who knows? knows? <laughs> you know, I would, hope, I would hope that Satoshi, who created it, um, has the, you know, the inclination to say, you know, either I would like to give away a lot of this Bitcoin or I will never sell it, therefore making uh, your few Satoshis that you own worth a little bit more. That'd mm. be really cool. And Nick, um, how do you get around the terminological challenges? I, again, I'm fascinated by your opinion on this because inside the BTC camp, we do see other camps emerge, you know, these sub camps um, and, and schools of thought. And one of them is the SOV narrative, very strong. And the other is the currency. And because you're such a proponent of peer-to-peer -peer access to money, what are your thoughts on this? Because an SOV is not necessarily or a currency at all. Yeah. Well, I would say a currency has to serve as a store. I think they're, they're in kind of in tangent. And I, I've, I've made this point a few times because a lot of people, and trust me, I'll, I'll get some people who disagree when I say this. Mm. Um, but the, the thing is, I talk to a lot of um, kind of alternative uh, type financial individuals and stuff who are usually those in crypto space. And I always ask them, I'm like, outside of real estate, what do you think is the largest store of value in the world? And most people would say, oh, it's gold, silver, something along that, maybe even crypto. Mm. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's currency. It's, it's dollars. And, and you know, as much as dollars depreciate, the second largest store of wealth in this world is either currencies or treasuries. It really depends on how you look at it. But that's the fact of the matter. Like at mm. the end of the day, most people store their wealth in cash through a right. digital savings account. Well, see, or through see, Nick, that's the challenge though, is that if that's the case, um, and you know, it's fascinating because we've seen currencies historically play out with SOVs part of the continuum of their development and, and evolution. But if, in this context, we're seeing these subcamps and subcamps emerge where there's a real um, a real entity behind them. You know, it might be just a group of people. You know, those that are driving uh, forth an agenda for just pure uh, SOV purism, for example, where they just want people to store and not use. That's the interesting part I have. You know, as a question to you, because currency is supposed to be used. That's where that commodity, that, that utility sort of changes form into the currency. So at what point can we validate this as a currency if we're not seeing evidence of it being used beyond its store of value? Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes sense. So for example, like people in the West, like, you know, let's say for example, you're in Australia, I'm in the US. Most of us here, anyone who's putting money in Bitcoin, we already have, you know, the Aussie dollar and the US dollar. We have good currencies to use in day-to-day -day life. It's frequent with merchants. In the case of Bitcoin, to us, it's a speculative asset. Right. There are people, for example, I, I know people personally, for example, who are uh, from all the way from regions such as Egypt to the Philippines to Thailand to areas of the world and also Venezuela, as we talked about in Argentina. You see there's, there's conferences in, uh, in Argentina right now that are pulling hundreds, if not up to 1,000, 1,100 people. You know, the reason being is because they need it there. They've experienced cyberinflation. And I know people personally from those countries I listed who use cryptocurrencies as currency for payments uh, and also to store value. It's, it's, an, it's an essential part because most of the money we don't use on a day-to-day -day basis. We just need to be able to spend it when we need it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the fact of the matter is, towards your question, yeah, there's a, there's a HODL community, especially on like things like crypto Twitter, or crypto YouTube. Why? Because most of us, I would say, are probably either, I, I don't want to use the general term Westerners because there's a lot of Eastern part of the world that are developed. But sure. um, I would say, I'd say people who are uh, in the first world economy, in this case, we, we treat crypto as a speculative way to potentially make money in the long term because we mm -hmm. know that if this continues to grow as a hedge for the world, uh, you know, this is going to be a multi-trillion dollar asset. I think class. that's the point, Nick, is that there are those that prospect for gold, you know, with the understanding of, you know, the implications of gold and currency. And then for that reason, really in, um, 
propose and the narrative or, or put forth uh, and support the idea that there'll be a growth in that asset. You know, they regard it as an asset essentially, but then there are those that colour it very differently as something that, as you said, can be utilised for them in their in, in their daily lives. So how this plays out in the future, how do you see Bitcoin in, you know, in the next, let's say, few years? Do you think it's going to stabilise, you know, more so rather than be as volatile as it is right now? We've, we've seen just in the last month, it's a massive volatility, even in Bitcoin and all the cryptocurrencies. But surely at some point for those in those regions that most need that support as a currency, wouldn't they need to have it uh, be less volatile? Stable, yeah. It's a good question. So there's a, a few points to make. In the sense of Bitcoin's volatility, if you look historically, um, it depends on what time frame you look at and what volatility measurement. But for the most part, Bitcoin's actually gotten less volatile. Uh, the major cycles that it's gone through, it's gone through a, um, a I think it's a, was it a 10, no, sorry, it's a thousand X from its lows. And then it went through, right. I think a hundred X and a 50 X and then a 20 X in the last cycle. There's been a lot of periods where Bitcoin has just gone exponential and it's also had 80, 90% retracements, crazy retracements. Mm. Um, so the thing about Bitcoin is that we, as we continue to grow towards a larger asset class, and this is for crypto in general, that you're going, especially if you have a limited or finite supply, you're going to see, even though it may appear volatile compared to most financial assets, that volatility decreases. Um, most of the indicators for long-term volatility, volatility will show that, that we're going on lower ramps of volatility. It's the same exact thing that's happened with gold over the last century. Um, gold has had lowering volatility in general over time. And the, the thing to take into account um, in the sense of uh, being, sorry, I want to actually want to make sure if I get your your um, absolute question. Can you repeat what you were focusing on, Brad? I kind of lost it for a second. Oh, that's okay. It was just with regard to seeing it, the trajectory change from volatility across to more stability. Ah, yes. So there is a solution that you can utilize, um, and this is something that a lot of people have argued. Some people who say, "Look, Nick, you know, you're gun hone on it being used as currency. It's never going to be as currency." Um, to convince me why crypto is still relevant. And I have uh, no doubt it could possibly never be, there can possibly be a day where no one ever uses Bitcoin. I, I don't think people, um, you know, a lot of people will be familiar with it, especially in areas that don't need it. There's a mm. lot of areas that don't need crypto. So what I think you are going to see is what we're seeing with MakerDAO's DAI in this case. Uh, you know, it, in order to create the currency for DAI, you have to collateralize it with Ethereum. So what I think in the future you're going to see, and this is going to be a huge push for Bitcoin to eventually have some kind of programmable framework on top of it, or it's going to push for things like RSK, which have come out as recent. Mm -hmm. And that is to use crypto as collateral, to use crypto not just as collateral in nature, but as a store of value, right? Now, this is something that was common in the United States, the gold standard. It used to be that when you would go to a bank, you'd be able to, a $20 note, could get you, I think it was, an, it was an ounce or a gram of gold. I can't remember. The, I think it was an ounce at the time. Mm. The dollar was that strong. You used to be able to get an ounce of gold with $20. And you had that promise and trust when you went to the bank. And it's the exact same case scenario. It's very close in nature to make your house die. We know in, an, in, in a uh, trustless framework, it's all in the code, that die can only be generated when I've deposited Ethereum. And when I'm ready to get my Ethereum back, my collateral, the store of value, I then deposit my die back into the contract and I get my Ethereum back. Right. So I think, I think that that's what you're going to see. If, if crypto isn't used as a currency, it is going to be a store of value. It's proven that it's working towards that right now. And then it's going to be utilized uh, to generate fiat currency coins uh, that are you know, trustless in nature uh, to the code base and not to mention as well. Our censorship resistant and it's hey, so interesting it's, it's so interesting you know yeah. how we how things have evolved as well even now nick and even in australia for example and you know this is one of the most progressive regions for um utility um for you oh, sorry not for utility that's a poor term to use given we have utility tokens emerging but just in terms of uh, engaging with bitcoin for example as a currency um, some other well-known um, Australian YouTubers, uh, Alex, for example, is always talking from um, Nuggets News. He's talking about how um, we can pay our bills, for example, with BTC and other cryptocurrencies. Recently, just not far from me, there was a, a, a supply chain, a supermarket opened up, means in which we could go and um, buy our food utilising. So That's currencies, awesome. 
Yeah, so and that's a, that could roll out into other areas of the country. So people literally can go and support themselves using um, some cryptocurrencies rather than fiat. So it, it is certainly the narrative is changing. But my concern always is, you know, uh, uh, what does it mean for someone who's perhaps invested their funds into something like BTC in the short term and then seen it dramatically decrease over the year? I think that for young for, for those who have a little small amount of money, it can be very unnerving because of the volatility aspect of that. But shifting across more to the discussion of other um, sort of lexical uh, concepts like utility token, like, um, for example, security. Let's talk about that, Nick, because right now that's a hot topic. Um, it's been brought up with um, the Reg A, with Blockstack, with you know their approvals as a utility token. Uh, right now there's a lot of uh, entities worldwide suggesting that whilst STOs may or may not flourish, the whole concept of a security as you know in terms of trust is certainly something embedded in the mindsets of you know various governments and, and private sectors right around the world. So do you think that at any point in the future we're going to see a shift or something where there's a greater there's an influx in uh, dividend based uh, blockchain centric um, uh, shares, you know, and uh, systems in which people can essentially take part just like in small business sectors, just like they do in Wall Street. Yeah, I mean, I could see it. I, I think so long as the actual underlying technology of the blockchain that that STO is based on that pays out dividends um, is operates in a completely trustless nature, say like Ethereum, mm -hmm. uh, and that the STO that you own is uh, like a legal binding sense of ownership in this case. I would think that that could probably like work fine in that case. Right. But, so are you, you bullish know, in any sense on any of the issuance platforms that are coming now? I only mention that because I, I am very fascinated by some of them. Dusk was one I just spoke with and it just seems that regular, the regulatory bodies are paying, they're really heeding what's going on in that sense. And there's a, a greater sense of uh, symmetry between them because it's something that they're both used to. Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm not well rounded enough in it. The the problem I see right now is that there are a lot of STOs because it's kind of the next hype wave. I think. Mm. I mean, it's not that there's there's not that there's not some great projects there. I don't know about Dusk personally that well, um, and I, I got to look into it now that you speak highly of it because I don't mm. like what you. Well, the right. reason I I suggested is because if they run their own blockchain, everything changes, Nick. Because no longer do you have to rely on a layer two solution for a, for a securitized system, but you, mm -hmm. you fundamentally engineer it that way from the ground up. So, you know, as you know, I'm a, I'm a proponent of issuance platforms that build that, but it doesn't mean that I, I know for sure that, uh, the, that these will actually flourish. I don't, but I, I am pro regulation in, in many instances, even with BTC, right down to KYC and AML. I, I personally am a supporter of that. Well, I think it's, I'd say no matter what, if you're raising money for, you know, let's say some of these projects are raising 10, $50 million. Yeah. That's a security. Like it, I, even for utility tokens, there needs to be some re regulatory framework in place. Mm. Um, if you're raising people's capital like that. And I, I don't think you should, sh I, for example, I don't agree with, for example, like in the U S and we're just finally allowing people to do like, like early stage venture, like early stage angel investing in startups and, um, not to mention as well, like, you know, when it comes to ICOs, I think people should be able to invest in them, but they should be regulated and there should be standards in place. I have, to, I have to no protect doubt. them, obviously, yeah. so that they can, yeah, and also so it doesn't preclude people from the rights of investment and support and, and literally investment when we're talking about, you know, from that standpoint of SMEs and STOs if they ever do evolve. But then you have this interesting sort of conundrum emerging too, Nick, and that is what is exactly a utility token when we're not talking about things like BTC. Honestly, what I think there's still a big gray area in that term itself because it's used sometimes in different startups as, as a fundraising token, if not from almost all of them, uh, right down to the debates going on with the SEC, CFTC and other bodies around the world. Term, uh, lexically, it's still challenging. Legally, it's still challenging because they often start um, just trying to raise money for their project. And then they say they move into utility, but do they? Yeah. Uh, again, it's the reason why I think most altcoins are going to fail because they never came in with the proper model. And they, I think they trusted people who worked heavily in that space to give them a framework that was going to work. And just similar to the dot-com era, there's going to be a lot of projects that fail. And mm -hmm. the only utility model that I see possibly working 
is platforms that, you know, tokens that are built on platforms that have actual real utility and then having a model that's similar to a voucher or something that, you know, for example, in order to redeem a certain use case of that platform, exactly um, a certain amount of it, then that could work. But again, even, let's say for example, people buy up all the tokens that if that network can provide more, that would be kind of silly in that case. Like, you know, there's, you know, I, I think that, Again, there's there's still to this day no really solid utility token model that just has wowed me mm. and has made me confident where I'm like, this is going to be similar to Bitcoin or Ethereum. I'm, I'm know, with you and I can't wait yeah. to be in that situation where not only has it wowed me, but I've used it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so for example, just to plug a couple, I guess, that have got me thinking, you know, we can't be sure. But as you know, I was a proponent of um, quant network. You know, I don't own a single quant. I want people to know that. I made sure I didn't when I started to really talk about um, quant a long time ago. Um, I have an immense respect for Gilbert Verdian um, in what he's done. But the reason why I was interested in that was because that was, there was real business being done. You know, there, there was evidence that there was uptake from those sectors where they were willing to use fiat, but also through the licensing system and backend handling, as you said, um, engage with that token now one of the challenges inherent with any project whether that be corn or any of them is how it sits in the context of crypto because whether it be a legitimate project or whether it be something that is you know more questionable like some of the ones you're alluding to that we didn't name is that you still have the the challenge of the the greedy um un, un, uncorrelated uh subgroups perhaps Let's say that they, there's some planning involved or something built in where some mm, sort of malicious actors in the space, they want to capitalize on the scarcity of a token. It doesn't take a lot in that sense to really try to get a hold of a lot of them to really then have a strong stake in that, that, that entity. So it's always my concern that um, access to tokens may not always be used for the, uh, as we say, as a utility, but rather be something as an SO Nick, you know, misappropriated as such to misalign with the interests of that project. And then they stake it or hodl it or whatever. And that takes away from the true and authentic nature of that token, which is to be a viable utility. So mm -hmm. it's something that I think even teens struggle with because to me, quant is legitimate. You know, it ha it's proven itself already with the way in which it's done business. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's not also plagued with the same challenges of any other legitimate coin or, you know, in the future even, because there are bad actors in space, in, in crypto even, that, you know, just want it to be something that's going to be 10x tomorrow. Yeah. I think what you're referring to in the sense of quant, it's a common with a lot of altcoins out there is that when you're only traded on decentralized exchanges or a few kind of exchanges that are known for either excessive market making or wash trading, uh, well, that's the problem is unless you have proper KYC, that can go on on any exchange. Exactly. It's the, re exactly. It's the reason why, it's the reason why, for example, as I mentioned regulation earlier, if you're going to have an exchange, I don't care if it's decentralized or not. I, I'm, I'm a big like, you know, oh, censorship resistant, that's fine. But when you're doing, there are certain ways where you can manipulate markets and not everyone can learn about what wash trading is or what mm. market making is. There needs to be a framework to protect people from that and make sure that people aren't, you know, for example, trading on two different ends and saying, you know, you own 10 of a coin, you sell it to someone for this price and you just keep propping up the exactly. price. Yeah, exactly. And people don't, people don't, a lot of people don't know about that. It's as simple as it is. Mm. You just can't be aware of it because you don't see names when there's an order book, right? So um, true, Nick. And, and that's yeah. rife right through the system as well and liquidity, you know, and more trusted exchanges is an imperative obviously and even with quant i mean i'm never one to speak ill of them because i have such respect for the agenda that they put forth and having yeah. better exchanges in the future which is no doubt going to happen is only going to strengthen their veracity in the space and so that's yeah. the thing nick is that i want to see a cleaner crypto i really do i want to see utility those few that you know, are, are enabled now or could potentially exist i want to see them really come forth and showcase more than just you know currencies because i don't believe that's the only agenda of blockchain yeah there's a there's one project that i you know i take back what i said earlier uh there's one project that i i think in the top 10 that i mentioned and stuff it's actually my number two pick which is basic attention token mm -hmm. i think that is a very interesting utility model because 
uh, it does something that very few projects do. And it's something I call the chain of incentives where if your token is meant to be, there, there needs to be, um, you know, uh, someone who has to demand the token. It's the first thing who's going to need the token for your platform. Where's the utility in that token as well. Uh, and that's basic attention token is satisfied all three people. It's satisfied what advertisers need. It allows them to purchase ad space on the Brave browser. And I would hope eventually more platforms and more reach in this case to add more utility to it. Um, the the, the um, basic uh, basic attention token or BAT token uh, basically serves as a payment gateway for not only users for their attention, so they're rewarded unlike traditional systems where they don't receive anything. Mm. And then along with that, you're able to give that to content creators so they can actually make you know a living in this case, help you know helping us YouTubers out, right? You know, and we do love video. that. I mean, we love we really appreciate it when when there's uh, a very direct line for incentivization and rewards. We don't have yeah. to. There's no third party involved. That's it's the thing about cut. it. It's it's you honestly think about like paywalls and you think about all these areas where like people, for example, like look, I we would love to give you our research and content. But the thing is, we have to get by. Like we, we need like the donation of a cup of coffee, and that allows people to do that. Their attention mm. is worth that, and, and in a month they can make enough to support all their favorite subscription platforms. Well, I'll have to look into it more, Nick. And and, and obviously, I'm going to watch your video on your top ten that you put out today. Um, but I wanted to ask you more generally when you're doing your assessments, um, when you're trying to deduce down, what are the things you look for? I've written a few down, you know, because I'd done an interview recently, and I was going to, I was asked this question. I wrote down some things that I look for. I was just wondering what are the kinds of things that you really focus on when you're trying to make those key deductions? So first thing, obviously, whether it's the blockchain or DAG, whatever your, your, your network structure is, mm. do you actually need some form of centralization or sorry, some form of decentralization? Yeah, we don't want centralization. And do you need a token <laughs> yeah. very quickly? Yeah that's, the, yeah, that's the thing as well. Like does your token, does creating a token out of nothing, uh, is, is that actually valuable? And there's a lot of cases where it isn't. Um, about 95 percent <laughs> yeah uh, i'd i would b bump that up to 98 99, okay, 99. You, yeah and that's probably being, being that's being yeah we're being conservative and nice on this yeah, one so yeah we're, we're letting some projects sit away still but anyways like that's the point it's like m in most cases you don't need this kind of stuff like you know as we take a step back i think that it's a very interesting way to raise capital and if there's a way where you can uh, benefit the original investors in this case there's some form of utility token and transition out of that. You know, I think that that's how a lot of these projects that actually succeed are going to go. Mm. Um, I, I don't think we're going to have, I, for a while I was very sold on this idea that some people preached where it was like, Oh, we're going to live in the token economy. We're going to have a token for everything. No way. It will. It's not going to happen. And the, the, pro the problem I see with it is that people don't you know. Maybe if you make it work in the background where people don't think about it, maybe, but mm. people don't want to manage a thousand different. And nor do businesses, Nick, uh, with all the CEOs I've talked to and all the feedback that they've given when, because they're aligned with business interests, almost all of them say they want, uh, it's not blockchain. They want that uh, like from a, uh, they want businesses that are going to be more cost saving and efficient. So for them, they want applications, they want solutions. And they don't need to know about the blockchain and all of the mechanics that exist underneath. That's our job to understand. And that's the platforms themselves. Right. So for them, they just want to engage in fiat half the time. They don't want to deal with tokens. And that's the irony is it's the engines behind. It's what underpins everything that's sort of our playground and that we love to play in. Um, but for businesses, not so much. Yeah. So I even mentioned, for example, when I talked about Chainlink, um, the, the thing about chain link is obviously to probably utilize oracles on the network. You, you need some amount of the tokens in this case, uh, mm -hmm. to, to run and operate functions on oracles. Uh, but the thing is, uh, I believe that people are not going to go in the open exchange and they're not going to buy chain link tokens. I totally agree. Token. And what, what's going to happen as you've seen with the partnership with Google and Oracle, again, I, I mentioned in the video, it's pure speculation, but it makes sense to me is mm. that what's going to happen is that Google will facilitate all of this in the background. And that for all of the users who use Google cloud and use Oracle's cloud systems, and eventually I think Amazon and a lot of the other competitors as well. I agree. Well, and I think you, you're going to see even entities like Microsoft, SAP and others really start to move across as well, make the switch into decentralized yes. solutions as well, because they're already looking at it now.
Yeah, what they'll do on like on a practical level to actually set demand for some of these tokens is that when people say uh, through their traditional interface, I want, um, for example, oracles to manage data inputs for my smart contract, right? Mm. You know, let's say you're using Ethereum or Hyperledger, doesn't matter, whatever it is. Yeah, they're agnostic, of, so it doesn't yeah, really matter. What's going to happen is in the background, Google, Microsoft, they deal with buying the token, utilizing it for that. All you see is the front end display of your system is at work and your, it deducts whatever cost of the token. Exactly. So it's really easy in that sense. And that's the thing that we're looking for is we're finally at that stage where it's, for me, the middleware as well, Nick. It's not just the infra, you know, that bottom underlying tech. When these um, middleware solutions can really make it easy, that's what Oracle does. It, it is the conduit ultimately to make this seamless for everything to work in and, and provide that key solution that literally all dApps need as well. So once, you know, it becomes more clear, I think, uh, for developers and for th those that perhaps have been engaged in this kind of tech, what Chainlink and even Band Protocol and, and others like it could actually do, I think is really understated. I, I really yeah. mean it. It's so no, like valuable. I think some people get kind of scared by the term middleware and stuff. And just to kind of clarify it, like that's what Chainlink is in this case and all these things fixing the Oracle problem is the problem is I see so many people talking about the idea of like, oh, using blockchain for supply chain management or smart contracts for, um, you know, all kinds of different things from financial applications, supply chain management, gaming, uh, yeah, gaming, gambling. whatever it is. Mm. Yeah, even gambling, like that, that's, a, that's a market. Like it, it is. <laughs> no matter how great your market is and how, how much of a multi-hundred billion dollar or trillion dollar market it is and how blockchain can, and smart contracts can benefit, those 90% of use cases people are thinking about outside of just you know, speculating on tokens, sending value, storing value, everything else outside of that that is off-chain cannot materialize, Without especially... It without an oracle exactly. and that's the that's the whole thing and that's the reason why during 2017 and 2018 ethereum has had the technology to facilitate smart contracts smart, smart contracts are code and they work um we have no doubt about this but mm. we do not have the data sets to actually make smart contracts smart in a sense like exactly. they'll do as they're told but they're they're not very cr uh, creative or smart in nature because there's not much you can do with them until you have a data set, um, and that's and like you said, uh, you know, you're talking about as middleware. We need to get past this idea of like, oh, screw traditional systems, like screw traditional co corporations and exactly uh, staff, you know, and everything. You you need to connect to those things. We need to have a bridge to bring people on to a decentralized framework. Otherwise, we don't ever allow for mass adoption because that's honestly the key, Nick, is for us to have a system in which we want to advocate for more users, for more engagement. The only way you can have that is through, th through things like the Oracle because it brings business in, literally. You know, it brings developers in. It makes everything uh, flow, literally. It's between, just, from it's that is a perfect way to put it, Brad, just to build on that, like a flow. Like it's literally like, hey, you have all these traditional systems over here that you trust, rely, and utilize, and a blockchain can't service. No worries. Let's input that data and improve the management of that data, not to mention as well in the mm. amazing ways that you can make it functionable and the sense of smart contracts and remove exactly. trust. In Absolutely. And, and it doesn't take away from the value of the currencies, you know, especially the, the, the original uh, king of all, you know, BTC really led the way when it came to enfranchising change. It's still going to do that. Nothing's going to thwart that uh, agenda. It can't. It's leaderless. But on top of that, now we're starting to see really exciting business narratives, potentials, engagement with the tech, the tech that really should drive um, innovation and new ways of development. And that's certainly what's happening. I'm really excited to see that in the future. But Nick, it, as always, you are, you know, a plethora of knowledge. You know a great deal about blockchain. You know a great deal about currencies and, you know, all your experience in finance. Thank you so much just for your insights. Clearly, your passion for what all this can do is infectious. And it's always a pleasure catching up with you, mate, as a friend. And I've learned, you know, a lot as we always, you know, every time I do catch up with you, it's something, it's food for thought to take away. Brad, everything that you just said, right back at you, man. It's an absolute pleasure beyond. And like you said, I, I like it. It's just, it's a conversation in this case. I think there's so many interesting, you know, pivots and different focus points in this space that people could look into. 
And um, yeah, it's, it's always good to get a go, uh, another good perspective from a good friend in the space. Likewise, mate. So if you want to check out more of Nick's channel, I mean, he's, you know, he's world famous. He has data dash after all. Uh, make sure that you check out the description below. He has done a top 10 today. I'm going to be watching that. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you're interested in Chainlink, that's been one of the big ones today. Also look into some others that are coming forth as potential challenges and collaborators because really the, the space is still, still so nascent and that is being protocol as well, just for a tip, just for some fun. So Nick, thank you again for your time and we'll catch up soon. Awesome, Brad. I'll have to check him out. Thanks for having me on, man. No worries. Take care.